Virtually all geologists agree that the Grand Canyon was carved by water. The question is how quickly and when. Our guest today has traveled to the area for over four decades. We'll talk about some of his adventures and what the fossils say about the canyon's history. Coming up on today's edition of Origins, Reflections of the Grand Canyon with Dr. John Whitmore. Hello and welcome to Origins. I'm Ray Heipel. It's an honor to be your host today. During this program, we showcase interesting guests who present evidence from science along with other important facts validating the truth of creation and the accuracy of the Bible. Today's guest, Dr. John Whitmore, is an active creationist researcher and writer. His research focuses on the geology of Noah's flood, especially concerning the rocks of the Grand Canyon, which he has been visiting for over four decades. John started the geology program at Cedarville University in Ohio, where he has been teaching for over 30 years. He is also the editor for the Proceedings of the International Conference on Creationism, which is now located at the university. Welcome to the program, John. Thank you, Ray. We're gonna be looking at the Grand Canyon, and I wanna ask, just as we begin, is the Grand Canyon unique on this planet? It's a really a special place. Uh, I like it because it's in a desert and you can see uh, the rock layers and trace them out for miles and miles. And uh, they're just marvelously exposed there and a lot of geology that you can see. And that's really important for origins because rock layers don't lie, right? I mean, what you're seeing, there has to be a, an accounting for that. And as we analyze those things, use the scientific method, and really look at what the Bible says to give us our overarching, okay, this, this is the big picture, um, we can begin to unfold what happened and how it happened. Well, we have to interpret the rock layers, and Grand Canyon's a nice place to do that because we can see all the way from the very basement rocks uh, in the continent all the way up to some of the most recent rocks in the continent. And of course, uh, conventional geologists have one explanation for that. Uh, creation geologists have another. And they start from different places and they end at different places. That's right, yeah. You go to Grand Canyon and there's not soil and trees and, and things like that. And the rocks are all laid out uh, right there before you. You think of a canyon as being below sea level, but yeah. that's not the case at all, is it? Yeah, the rim of the canyon is between seven and 8,000 feet above sea level, depending on where you stand. So that's, that's you know, a mile, more than, more than right? a mile. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, that's higher even, than Denver, right? I mean, yeah, even the river is down around 3,000 feet. So, wow. yeah. So, Ray, I've been going to the canyon uh, for over 40 years now, and uh, I've had a chance to see a lot of things, experience a lot of things. Uh, there's always new places to see, new things to learn, uh, new experiences to have. Uh, no trip is, is ever the same. Well, even on the screen, the, the photo that you've chosen, you know, you see differences in those mm -hmm. rocks. I mean, you see the difference in color and then the, the clear uh, layer difference. Right. And, uh, and I'm sure you see these things all over the place. What do you find fascinating about the Grand Canyon that keeps bringing you back? Well, the, the colors there are amazing. I, I love to take photographs and, and do uh, photography. And this is one of my favorite places in the canyon. It's a uh, part of Marble Canyon, so it's in the upper part of the, the canyon. It's a place called Nankaweep, and just a beautiful uh, stretch of the river along there. Uh, each of the rock layers uh, have fossils in them. Each of the rock layers uh, tell us different different story. And the rock layers, uh, I believe, show us good evidence for Noah's flood. Um, I've done hiking in the Grand Canyon. I've also uh, gone on a number of raft trips as well. And so I've had, had the opportunity to see a lot of things. Now, were you uh, on that particular raft I, at that moment? I was moment? taking the picture. You're taking the picture? Yeah. So do you know the so people in that I raft? do, I do. They're all okay, I'm assuming. But, uh, yeah, that, that <laughs> boat, believe it or not, is 35 feet long. So that wow. is one big wave that they're sitting on. 
And there are rapids in the canyon that'll totally hide a raft. Wow. Uh, there are some huge rapids down there. But these are really big boats. This is typically how I go down the river. I've been on, I think, 18 river trips now. Mm. And uh, all our gear is loaded on these boats. Uh, so food, uh, camping wow. equipment, everything. Uh, the raft guides uh, cook gourmet meals uh, for us. Wow. Just uh, incredible experience down in the canyon. Well, that would be amazing. And how long of a trip are we talking, you know, from uh, in miles? I usually do seven day trips. There's also 10 day trips. There's also some shorter trips okay. uh, that you can and take And you're going down well. the Colorado River, right? Yeah, there's only a few places to put in and take out. So you got to get to the- You're committed. The, <laughs> you're committed, that's right. Where are we at here? Uh, this is down in the inner gorge of the canyon. So about uh, midway down the canyon, we're on the Colorado River here and uh, the canyon towers up above the, okay. uh, the river here. Um, a lot of times we will uh, stop and make camp alongside the river. We camp on sandbars, gravel bars, uh, canyon entrances and stuff like that. And that gives me a chance to teach about the geology of the mm -hmm. Grand Canyon. So I'm a college professor, but I also uh, really enjoy this classroom mm -hmm. where you know we're outside, we can see the rocks uh, behind us, I can lay the geological map out on the ground. Uh, you don't right have there. a whip and a cowboy hat, do you? Like an Indiana <laughs> no. Jones. I do use a stick sometimes as a okay. pointer. So that's my PowerPoint uh, right there okay. uh, in the sand. But it's uh, just a wonderful classroom uh, to teach in. Wow, uh, now that is a yeah. picture. So oftentimes we set our chairs up in circles and uh, you know I can stand in the middle there and teach. Um, you see one tent there in the picture. I think that was the sample tent that the raft guides set up. Usually you don't ever use a tent in the Grand Canyon because it's, uh, it's usually always fantastic weather. There's no bugs and, and the best thing about it is just sleeping out under the stars mm -hmm. and uh, seeing the star show at night. You, you almost uh, don't want to go to sleep. It's mm -hmm. so beautiful. You're making me want to go. Maybe I can <laughs> talk the producer into doing yeah. a few programs in the Grand Canyon. Yeah, so <laughs> uh, oftentimes we camp along uh, side rapids. You can see North Rapid. Uh, they're in the background, yeah. but uh, these rapids are often found at uh, canyon, side canyon entrances. Well, it looks like that. I mean, the water's right almost even with you there. Is it, are you like that close to the water? Yeah, in that, you're that close to the water. Huh. The water does go up and down a little bit. They let this water out of Glen Canyon Dam. Okay. And uh, depending on how much electricity they need, they either let out a whole lot of water or mm -hmm. just a little bit of water. But uh, typically uh, during the summer months, they're letting a lot of water out because mm. it's hot and they need to make a lot of electricity. John, what can you tell us about the layers, some of the layers that we're seeing in the background? They're really fascinating. Yeah. They're all very horizontal as in, we can uh, see them there. In the background there, that's the Supai uh, group of, of rocks in the Grand Canyon. <laughs> and most of these rocks have incredible evidence of being laid down underwater. Mm. And that's one of the things uh, that's characteristic of water laid rocks is they have nice flat layers in them. Yeah, you would think so, because the water yep. would, would flatten it out. Yep. Okay. So here's another camp. This was a night where it rained. Um, I think I've used a uh, tent one night in Grand Canyon. I didn't use a night. Uh, uh, a tent this night. It is night. Arizona, probably yeah. not a lot of rain through well, the year. Well, in the, in the uh, months of July, sometimes you get the monsoon rains in oh, California, so okay. you get afternoon thunderstorms and okay. whatnot. But uh, usually if you set up a tent, it's going to be pretty hot and sticky. So I prefer What are uh, some of the temperatures one. when you're in the Grand Canyon? Um, easily during the day, the temperatures are in the 120s uh, sometimes. 120? Yeah. So you're down in the canyon at lower elevation and the canyon walls just act like a reflector oven. Wow. Uh, fortunately, the water is really cold. So the Colorado River is about 50 degrees, which hurts your feet to stand in it, right? Wow. You take real quick baths. <laughs> now, we, we're, so. we do this program in Pittsburgh and we always talk about the humidity, but and, and of course, the big <laughs> joke is, well, it's dry heat. Yeah. So it, I would imagine 120, dry heat or not. It still feels, feels warm. warm. Yeah. <laughs> feels like you're in an oven. <laughs> yeah. Um, I've had a chance to take uh, my dad on one of my research oh, trips with wonderful. me. Uh, my son has had a chance to, nice. to go do some study. He's a, actually a geologist now. Mm. And uh, so it's been neat to kind of see him uh, follow in my footsteps. Oftentimes, we're, when we're on the river, there's just incredible wildlife to see. So this is a ram, bighorn sheep ram that, uh, you know, they're frequent oh, yeah, along the river. Oh, yeah, that's a beautiful animal. Uh, wow. You see deer, uh, there's beavers, um, 
There's bobcats, uh, mountain lions. I've not seen any of those, but they're around. You can see their footprints, uh, okay. rattlesnakes and scorpions and, you know, stuff like that as Hear well. Hear anything at night like coyotes howl? Uh, sometimes, or? yeah, okay, sometimes, okay. Um, yeah. So, John, is this slide here the whole Grand Canyon? This is the whole Grand Canyon. Uh, the Grand Canyon uh, begins uh, right up here uh, at the end of Lake Powell. There's Glen Canyon Dam uh, up there. And then the canyon uh, goes through uh, the Colorado Plateau. It kind of winds around this way all the way to the beginning of Lake Mead, which is right there. Okay. That's 277 miles approximately. And that's all the Grand Canyon? Yeah. Oh, wow. And so it's an amazing uh, raft trip. Uh, usually the raft trips that I go on, they take out right about there. So you raft down to there and fly out by helicopter. And, and the helicopter flies you out to uh, Barton Ranch, which is up in that area. And then they bring a new set of people down to get on the rafts to, to go down the rest of the river. Oh, wow. Uh, so it's really quite an operation. But uh, from Lee's, Lee's Ferry up here is where we uh, begin the launch to the Whitmore Canyon area. Uh, that's about 187 river miles or so. Now, when you do these trips, is it in, like you're teaching or, or do you go sometimes exclusively with other scientists because you know, you're know you on a research I've mission? I've done both. Um, I've done trips where people go on the trip for a vacation and I'll teach the geology. Uh, I've done trips where uh, we have seminary professors, uh, college professors and things like that, college presidents where I'm teaching mm -hmm. them about the geology. And in those trips we're talking about uh, scripture and geology uh, quite a bit. And I've also done some research trips as well. Okay. Uh, and I've both I've done stuff that's both on the river uh, and up on the rim. Is the whole canyon basically the same elevation throughout? Um, it changes in elevation. Uh, the highest spot in the canyon is is right through here. Uh, you can see how it's green right in there or darker in color. Those are actually trees and plants and and whatnot right in there. And that brings me to a point, oftentimes people ask me how the Grand Canyon was carved. And as a scientist, I, I don't know exactly how the Grand Canyon was carved. That's something uh, that we're working on. Uh, one of the really cool ideas uh, at this time is that there's a, an idea that there might have been a lake uh, right up in this area. And there's a little bit of evidence for, for some lake deposits and things like that uh, in this area. And we think that lake breached uh, this dam, this high spot uh, where all these green trees are and so forth. Mm -hmm. We think that acted like a dam and then the water overspilled uh, that area and cut. we think the canyon got cut out pretty quickly because of that. Would you say that that happened uh, close to the time of the flood, hundreds of years later? I think actually it would have happened hundreds of years after the flood. Okay. Um, I think a lot of these processes that we see out here are probably post-flood, and uh, that gets a little deep into some of the geology there and technical uh, geology, but I think uh, the best answer is it was uh, a lot of this was cut after the flood. Uh, there's some other really interesting things. You can see the, the dark areas, especially right in here. Uh, those are volcanoes. Uh, there's a lot of volcanic rock in there, and there are actually lava flows that come over the edge of the Grand Canyon, and on a number of occasions, they've blocked up the Colorado River and there uh, was a big lake in Grand Canyon. And then that lake overtopped the lava dam, eroded the lava can dam out, and then another lava dam formed and so on. So these volcanoes are active? Uh, or... they, they were active uh, after the flood. Uh, there aren't any active okay. ones there today, okay. but yeah, they were at the time. Hmm. Probably the Native Americans saw some of these things erupt. Okay. Yeah, but uh, pretty neat place. Um, I've been uh, involved in a number of research uh, uh, opportunities in Grand Canyon. One of the things I've looked at is uh, the Coconino sandstone, which is, is right in there, uh, not too far from the rim. So most of the time I've hiked down uh, to study Coconino sandstone. And a lot of people say that the Coconino is made of fossilized desert sand dunes. So a lot of the research that I've done is uh, aims to try to show that that was made underwater. Mm. And I've, I've done some other research as well. Um, uh, this is a research trip that I'm on with uh, Dr. Andrew Snelling from Answers in Genesis. And notice the people that are down wow. here. Yeah, that gives you a so size you scale. Get there. an idea how big that cliff is. But the spectacular thing is here, the bends 
in the, those rocks. Uh, so notice that the rock layers are not flat, they're bent, and that's one of the things that Dr. Snelling is studying, uh, trying to figure out the origin, the timing of, of this uh, bending. So I was involved on a research trip with him uh, to, to help figure that out. And here, Dr. Snelling and I uh, getting this uh, figured out and, and doing some of the research, collecting some rock samples mm -hmm. there. That's fascinating because with the bending rock, obviously it had to bend before it was hard That's right. or it would have broken. That's right. That's exactly what he's trying to, trying to demonstrate with yeah. his research. Are there other places in the world where you can see that sort of thing and can say, hey, we know it happened yeah. by water here or something? Well, like that. you're in Pennsylvania, right? So there's all kinds of bent rocks in the Appalachians. And we think this is uh, generally true when you see bent rocks. They formed, uh, the bending happened when the rocks were still soft. What would be another? Is there, are there other possible alternatives or what, what would like an evolutionist uh, say about not that? Not many. Um, another way you could bend things is to bury it very deeply and, and bend it under heat and pressure. Uh, but the thing with these rocks is they don't have any evidence of heat and pressure. Uh, so we think the bending had to happen uh, without heat and pressure. And this the only isn't way the volcanic section no, earlier. Yeah. The only way to explain this is bending it while it's soft. Okay. So so well that makes sense. John, I'll have to stop you right there. We need to take a break. More on the Grand Canyon after this. Stay with us. Scientific materialism, the belief that life is nothing more than the product of blind, undirected processes. Why has our world chosen to push a pseudoscience that is neither fact-based nor provable, but instead is a narrative simply designed to push their own agenda? It is time to embark on an amazing journey as we delve into several facets of science. Paleontology, geology, astronomy, microbiology, genomics, and more. Each one of these areas confirming the work of our Creator. We're inviting you to come along with us in this unique presentation, The Miracle of Creation, for your gift of only $20. From Dr. Danny Faulkner and the wonders of our universe, to Dr. Marcus Ross and the discovery of soft tissue inside dinosaur bones, you will be captivated, entertained, and astounded as the true facts of science ring out, pointing to its author as the creator of all. To get your copy, write to Origins, Cornerstone Network, 1 Signal Hill Drive, Wall, PA, 15148, or call 412-824-3930. Get your DVD today for only $20 and find out how God has made himself known for all who are willing to see. Welcome back to Origins. We're talking to Dr. John Whitmore, who's been sharing with us about the Grand Canyon, a place that you've been to quite a number of times. Yeah, quite a few times. And, uh, I've, you know, it's, I've been going there over 40 years now. And in this little segment, I want to talk about some of the fossils that we find there. So here are some fossil footprints of, we don't know what they are, but either reptiles or amphibians. And you can see little pairs of trackways here. And this animal was, was going in this direction, but these footprints are in rock. Uh, it looks like they might just be in wet sand or something, but these are in rock. These are some of the fossil footprints uh, that can be found in the Coconino sandstone. And the best way to understand these footprints is that they were made, actually made underwater. Uh, my advisor in uh, grad school did a whole series of experiments where he took amphibians and he made them crawl on dry sand, made them crawl on wet sand, and then he got the idea, I wonder what the footprints would look like if you make them underwater. And so he made a little sand dune underwater in his aquarium and had them walk up the sand dune, and this is exactly what they look like here, the ones that we find in the rock. And of course, something had to happen on top of this, right, to harden that because right. it's not going to last long. Well, otherwise. you got to bury them pretty quick, and then, then the hardening takes place after that. Okay. So you got to preserve them quick or they're going to get destroyed. Okay. Yeah. So there's a, some other fossils, too, and one of the fossils 
that I really like the most are these uh, ice cream cone uh, shaped fossils. Uh, there's, there's the cone and you can see these little segments right here. This is actually a fossil squid. Oh, wow. And the uh, the the animal, the the tentacles and stuff would have would have come out in this this direction. There would have been a big eye uh, right in there and so forth. But these are fossil squid, and there are literally billions of these that occur in Grand Canyon. Now, squid is a and very soft creature, right? An invertebrate. Right. It would seem to me that this is something that would not be preserved. Unless well, you had, uh, the, the soft parts of the squid didn't get preserved. The hard parts did. This was a kind of a squid that had a shell. And so this ice cream uh, cone shaped thing is the, the shell that the squid okay. lived in. Okay. And uh, there's some squids that have a circular shell. There's still one alive today called the Nautilus uh, that, that's very similar to this, but it has a coiled shell. These were straight shelled uh, squid. Now, is this in the wall of the canyon that you can see right now? Or yep, is this... there's several okay. places along the Colorado River where you can get out and look at these. Uh, there's also places out near Las Vegas and beyond uh, where you can go see them as well. This is a very widespread fossil bed. Uh, one of my professors, Steve Austin, uh, studied these and was able to present at a geologic conference that, that these uh, squid were made catastrophically. and. Uh, it was really amazing when he uh, made this presentation. It was a, at a, a secular geology meeting, probably 8,000 geologists in attendance. And um, scientists have about 15 minutes to share. They give a talk for 15 minutes and then the next guy gets up and talks and so on. And word got out that a creationist was gonna give a talk at this meeting. <laughs> And so all these secular geologists packed into this room, maybe about 600 people in a room made for 300 people, if you know what I mean. Wow. And the, uh, Dr. Austin gave his talk, and after the talk there was just silence, and, and he did such a good job that I, I think he convinced those geologists that this bed actually did happen quickly, mm. but they were worried about, does that mean we have to believe in Noah's yeah, flood now yeah. or something like that? Maybe they could and buy, <laughs> okay, it was quick, but you know, yeah. some kind of evolutionary quick. That's right, right. Yeah. that's yeah. right. So, um, you know, that, that's one of my favorite fossils in the canyon. Mm. Um, I've done some other things in the canyon as well. Uh, this is Coconino uh, sandstone up here. And under the Coconino sandstone, there's these, uh, they're, they're kind of like wedges uh, that, that force their way down into the red formation down below. And one of the things that I did with this is, is I determined that the sand was forcefully injected downward into uh, the Coconino. And these, uh, these, I think, are called injectites. That's what I published, uh, published these. As, these are called sand injectites. Published it in a secular journal. And... Uh, a neat story about this is I was at a, a geology conference one year presenting this. A uh, park ranger from Grand Canyon came up, was talking to me, uh, was very excited about all the work that I'd done and, and the interpretation uh, that I had made and, and so forth. And she said, oh, you got to come to the canyon and talk about this, give a presentation. You need to publish it here and there. And then I said, well, you know <laughs> that you know, these can only be explained catastrophically. They need to be made catastrophically. And, um, you know, she understood that what I was saying, that there was a, a time problem in the conventional view. Mm. And all of a sudden, my explanation didn't work, even though she was, was very excited about it earlier, was right? Revoked, yeah. And so it's amazing what somebody's worldview can do yeah. to either help them accept an idea or mm. cause them to reject an idea, even though the evidence might be really good. You know, it's, it, and again, I, I wouldn't know anything about the science here, but the idea in my mind of something being injected okay. over, you know, hundreds of thousands of years just seems absurd. I mean, if it's yeah. injected, it had to happen quickly. Yeah, so this, this we think was actually uh, caused by an earthquake uh, that happened and the jiggling of the earthquake made this be injected really quick. Mm. Uh, the problem is the, the Coconino is supposed to be about um, 275 million years old and the injection is supposed to happen about 50 uh, 
you know, a million years ago. Okay. So that's a difference of 225 million years, and the, they got by problem. then the rock should have been been hardened up mm -hmm. really quick. Uh, a lot of times uh, when I do research in the Grand Canyon and when others do research, uh, we publish it. And so here's a, a picture of my advisor, Leonard Brand, and, and one of the students that have had Sarah Meithel. Uh, she has her PhD now. And uh, they've, they've done a lot of work on the Coconino as well. And so uh, we have a, a good core group of us that have been working uh, on rocks in the Grand Canyon and various problems in the Grand Canyon and publishing these things for a number of years. And I think it's really important that we not just let uh, the creationist community know what we're doing, but we also put these ideas and publish these ideas in the secular literature too. It's very important to get feedback uh, from our secular colleagues. Sure. And that's something that, that we, uh, uh, you know, sometimes it's not always enjoyable, especially if somebody, you know, is, is pretty confrontational uh, mm -hmm. with you. And mm -hmm. we've had uh, those experiences, but uh, it's important nonetheless to get out there and, and let the rest of the community know what you're up to. Absolutely. I, I think, you know, we have the truth, right? We have scripture and we have the right understanding of, of what happened in this world. And so that, be, that becomes a powerful tool, uh, not just for fact and truth, but to show people that there's a God, that they're going to stand before him someday and that they're going to have to give an account. That's right. So I hope you've uh, enjoyed seeing a few of my reflections Absolutely. from the canyon. And I know you probably could and, uh, have talked for a lot yeah. longer, uh, four decades worth of visiting there. Well, yeah. uh, I hope to have you back on the show and maybe we can talk a little bit more about the Grand yeah, Canyon. Absolutely. All right. Thanks, Thank John. You, the Grand Canyon is one of the most fascinating places in the world. It provides access to hundreds of miles of the Earth's layers. And for creationists, it is becoming an important part of the argument for the truth of Noah's flood and therefore for the accuracy of scripture. It just goes to show you that we know what the Bible says is true and the proof, it's all around you. If you enjoy Origins, we sure could use your help to keep this creation television program on the air. Your support both prayerfully and financially make a big impact. So let's work together to reveal how awesome our creator is and we'll see you next time. Thank you for watching this edition of Origins. For a DVD of this program, you can order online or send a $12 donation to cover shipping and handling and write to Origins, program number 2108, Cornerstone Network, Wall, Pennsylvania, 15148. This presentation was made possible by the faithful prayers and financial support of you, our Cornerstone family.